2002 was an interesting year for the Resident Evil series. Capcom effectively turned the clock back with the release of two games centred around the mansion incident in the original title. One was a prequel focusing on the exploits of Star's Bravo team, which became Resident Evil Zero, and the other was a straight-up remake of the first Resident Evil. The remake began as part of an exclusivity deal signed between Capcom and Nintendo, where Capcom would agree to port existing Resident Evil titles over to their new GameCube console, and develop new ones to take advantage of the machine's advanced hardware. If this setup sounds familiar to you, it's because a similar deal had previously been struck with Sega, eventually leading to the release of Code Veronica on the Dreamcast. Low sales of the Dreamcast console ultimately scuppered the Sega deal, but Nintendo were a different prospect, and Capcom were confident they'd be successful this time around. As work began to port over Resident Evil's legacy titles, it became clear that the original game hadn't aged very well in the years since its release. Shinji Mikami saw an opportunity to remake it, using the GameCube's extra graphical muscle to deliver an experience more in line with what he'd originally imagined. This remade game would feature the same basic setting, characters and storyline as the original, but would add in extra features and locations that had been cut due to time and hardware constraints. Nintendo certainly weren't going to argue against his plan, and the game was quickly given the go-ahead. Production started in 2001 with a team of only four programmers, as most of Capcom's staff were tied up in other projects. Since the setting and story had already been established, the main challenges facing the team were technical ones. None of them had worked on the GameCube before, so they basically had to learn how to develop it from scratch. Much like Sega, Nintendo actually loaned out some of their own developers to help Capcom better understand the GameCube's architecture. The remake again featured 3D models superimposed over pre-rendered backgrounds like the original. However, the backgrounds would now make use of particle effects and full motion video layers to simulate things like rushing water and swaying tree branches. Creating higher levels of fear and anticipation was considered a priority, so many of the game's backgrounds featured a high contrast between dark and light so enemies could appear from the shadows unexpectedly. Capcom auditioned real actors to serve as visual references for the character designers, and motion capture was used to animate their movements so that they appeared more natural and fluid this time. They also hired new voice actors and rewrote the game's script to make the plot more convincing and less... well, you know. Oh, Barry! That was too close. You were almost a Jill sandwich. <laughs> You're right! The extra development time and storage capacity of the GameCube allowed Capcom to add in areas and characters that had previously been dropped. For example, the graveyard that was originally intended for the PlayStation version was finally made real, as well as larger outdoor areas and an expanded tunnel system beneath the mansion grounds for the player to explore. Another addition is a subplot involving the character Lisa Trevor, the mutated daughter of the mansion's original owner who now stalks the tunnel system in search of her dead mother. Initially the gameplay mechanics were kept largely unchanged, but as the game neared completion Capcom started making more substantial additions. The inventory was expanded so that players could carry a standard item like Jill's lockpick, while defence items were introduced to give players a chance to fend off enemies as a last resort. Realising that the zombies were no longer threatening or intimidating for experienced players, Capcom altered their design so that previously defeated enemies could suddenly spring back to life as faster and stronger Crimson Heads. This addition would encourage players not to let their guard down, even in areas that had previously been cleared out. The Resident Evil remake was developed over the course of a year or so, with the dev team gradually expanding as the game took shape. Final development was particularly intense, with the programming team having to work seven days a week for two straight months to meet their deadline. This hard work ultimately paid off, and Resident Evil was released in March 2002 in Japan and April in North America. Critics praised the graphics, storyline and atmosphere, but unfortunately this critical success wasn't reflected in its sales numbers. Much like with Code Veronica, the remake was again handcuffed to a failing system that just didn't have a big enough user base to make it a financial hit. Unfortunately, Shinji Mikami drew his own conclusions from the situation, deciding that the core theme of survival horror was no longer appealing to players, and that the series needed to move in a more action-oriented direction to stay relevant. This change of strategic priority would ultimately lead to the massively successful Resident Evil 4, but it would also set the stage for overblown failures like Resident Evil 5 and 6, which strayed too far from the successful formula of the original. However, that's a story for another day. So what is the Resident Evil remake actually like? Well, at the risk of sounding like a complete fanboy, I have to say that this game is nothing short of stunning, retaining the spirit and core mechanics of the original while improving on it in virtually every way possible. The first and most obvious thing you'll notice is the graphics. Without being unduly generous, they are quite simply spectacular. Detailed, complex and beautifully rendered. 
The game's been ported to various consoles over the years and remastered in HD, but even the original GameCube version is gorgeous to look at. Not bad when you consider it came out just three years after this. The mansion is now darker, more brooding and dilapidated than before, greatly heightening the feeling of foreboding and tension as you venture down the dingy hallways. Everywhere you look you see signs of decay and neglect. This is very much a place where bad things happen. Backgrounds are fully animated, meaning that candles cast flickering lights on the walls, muddy water trickles down a rocky stream bed, and leafless trees sway back and forth mournfully in the breeze. It's captivating and atmospheric, really helping to transport the player into the game world. Yeah, it's basically just FMV sequences running on a loop, but who cares when it looks this good? Character animations are fluid and realistic, and the detailed facial models based on real actors mean they can display the full range of emotions, instead of looking like dinner plates that somebody painted eyes and a mouth onto. Sorry, Code Veronica. You are not worthy of its power! The script has been revamped and new, more competent voice actors brought in, giving the game a more mature feel and ditching some of the hokey B-movie feel of the original. Enemies are largely unchanged in terms of variety, though as I mentioned previously, the zombies have been altered so that downed enemies can sometimes spring back to life as faster and stronger crimson heads, requiring more firepower to deal with. It's a brilliant idea that means you never truly feel safe even after you've cleared out a room of enemies. Boss fights are bigger and more intense than before, particularly the mutated shark encounter in the flooded basement which becomes a set piece battle all of its own, and the addition of new enemy Lisa Trevor is another inspired touch. Taking the form of a monstrous mutated woman wearing the rotting faces of her previous victims, she's seemingly immune to everything you throw at her. Instead, she slowly stalks you through the disused tunnels beneath the mansion, her tortured cries echoing through the darkness as you desperately look for a way out. I've played this game through multiple times and this section still leaves me feeling tense and uneasy. The game map has also been enlarged and improved, with entirely new areas, rooms and doorways that were never included in the original game. There's something strangely disconcerting about walking down a familiar hallway only to find a new doorway which branches out into an area you've never seen before. Additions like this really help to keep the player on their toes, ensuring you never become complacent. Core gameplay mechanics are mostly the same as before. You explore the mansion looking for keys to open up new areas, solve puzzles, fight enemies and manage a limited stock of weapons and health items. You can save your progress on typewriters scattered around the map, but each save requires an ink ribbon and you only have so many to go around. Carry space is limited, so you have to be prudent about what you take with you, and as before, you can dump items in an inventory chest that are magically linked for the sake of convenience. One new addition is the use of personal defence items as a last resort to fend off the undead. If you have one equipped and a zombie manages to get hold of you, your character can use this item to get out of trouble. Chris will knife it in the head, while Jill will shove a taser in its face. Taser face. Exactly. It's a clever little system that helps balance out the increased threat of the Crimson Heads, and one that saved my life more than once. Overall then, I really can't say enough good things about the Resident Evil remake. It's everything you could ever ask for in a reboot of your favourite game, taking what was good about the original and making it better in every way possible. I genuinely consider it one of the best games in the entire series, and hold it up as a perfect example of everything a Resident Evil game can and should be. And that concludes part 5 of my Resident Evil retrospective. I hope you found it interesting and informative. If so, please consider hitting like and subscribe, and join me in part 6 where we'll look at another Resident Evil title released for the GameCube, Resident Evil Zero.